Welcome to the True Crime Lyricist Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Lewis. Today, on Shit Out of Luck, we dive into John Dillinger, one of America's most infamous gangsters. First, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Pumdex, for sponsoring this episode. You can save 10% off your first purchase by using the promo code Larry21. And also, thanks to Audible for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in getting a free Audible of your choice, just sign up for their 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Larry21. And as always, you can be a part of the show by sending us a voicemail at 682-305-0483. And we'll keep your name anonymous if you'd like. So today, we're diving into John Danger. Following the prohibition era in the United States in the 1920s, the country witnessed an unprecedented wave of organized crime, gang killings, bank robberies, and extortion of all kinds. The gang commonplace. Often referred to as the gangster era, this period gave rise to legendary criminals such as Al Capone, Bugs Moran, Bonnie and Clyde. But one of the most fascinating and evasive criminals of the era was none other than a man named John Dillinger who, in the 1930s, would gain notoriety as perhaps the most famous bank robber in all of U.S. history. This is the story of Dillinger, a year-long crime spree, his daring escapes from prison, and eventually how he was caught. John Herbert Dillinger was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, on June 22, 1903. He experienced a difficult childhood, beginning with the death of his mother when he was only three years old. He grew up in a middle-class residential neighborhood. Dillinger's father, a hardworking grocer, raised his son with disciplinary extremes in a very harsh and repressive environment at times. After his father remarried six years after the death of Dillinger's mother, the boy had a strange relationship with his stepmother, whom he resented. He began getting into trouble in school and eventually dropped out. He soon got a job in an Indianapolis machine shop where he was said to be a good and intelligent worker. However, he quickly grew bored of his work and began to stay out all hours of the night. Worried that his son would become corrupted by the temptations of a big city, John's father moved his family to a farm in Mortisville, close to Indianapolis. Experts believe the relocation had little effect on Dillinger's behavior and personality. He remained the same bewildered, loose cannon he was in the city. This led him to his first issue with the law due to auto theft. Following this incident, he joined the Navy in 1923. He was 20 years old and served on the USS Utah, which he deserted within a few months after quickly getting in trouble on duty. Following this, Dillinger returned to Indianapolis. Then in 1924, he married 16-year-old Beryl Ethel, but was unable to find work in the city. This led him to join the t- town pool shark at Singleton, whose goal was to find easy money. He was soon caught in a failed holdup at Mooresville Grocer in September 1924. Along with Singleton, Singleton pled not guilty, stood his trial, and was sentenced to two years in prison. Dillinger, however, following the advice of his father, who urged him to confess to the crime, was convicted of assault and battery with intent to rob, as well as conspiracy to commit a felony, which landed him a joint sentence of two to 14 years and 10 to 20 years in the Indiana State Prison. According to the FBI, it was the seemingly harsh sentence which led to Dillinger's time in prison, turning him into a tortured, bitter man. Regardless, Dillinger made the most of his sentence and spent his time in prison learning the art of bank robbery, along with his fellow inmates. He gained parole on May 10, 1933, after serving eight and a half years and almost immediately began his career as a bank robber. His first robberies included those of five Indiana and Ohio banks within four months. And he soon began to gain recognition as a daring, sharply dressed gunman. In September 1933, he was captured in a robbery in Bluffton, Ohio, and was lodged at the county jail in Lima while awaiting trial. A month later, he would complete his first unforgettable jailbreak with the help of some old friends. While frisking Dillinger, police in Lima found a document which appeared to be a plan for a prison bank. Dillinger, however, claimed to have no knowledge of such a plan. Even so, Four days later, eight of Dillinger's pals escaped from the Indian 
Indiana State Prison using the exact plans and shot two guards on their way out. Two of these escaped prisoners arrived at the Lima Jail, where Dillinger was held on October 12th. He told the sheriff they were there to return Dillinger to the Indiana State Prison for violation of his parole. The sheriff asked for the men's credentials, to which one of them pulled out a gun, shot the sheriff, and beat him until he was unconscious. The escaped convicts then stole the jail keys, freed Dillinger, locked away the sheriff's wife, and deputy in the cell and made a swift getaway. The sheriff was left to die on the jail floor after the bandits made their escape. Unfortunately, he was not the last man to meet his fate at the hands of Dillinger and his infamous gang. After this particular jailbreak, the FBI's help was immediately requested in assisting to identify the criminals. Though the men had technically not violated any federal law, the men were identified as Harry Pierpont, Russell Clark, Charles McAuley, and Harry Copeland. And their FBI fingerprint cards were marked with red metal tags indicating they were now wanted criminals. Even so, this didn't deter Dillinger or his gang from doing what they did best. Following the escape from Lima, Dillinger and his crew began a grand series of bank robberies, terrorizing establishments in Indiana, Wisconsin, Florida, and Tucson, Arizona. Throughout this year-long spree, they also plundered police arsenals in Auburn and Peru, Indiana, where they stole several machine guns, rifles, revolvers, ammunition, bulletproof vests. In Chicago, gang member John Hamilton shot and killed a police detective. A month after that, the gang killed another police officer in a robbery of the First National Bank of East Chicago, Indiana. After this, they escaped to Florida and headed to Tucson, Arizona. While in Tucson, they were found and arrested by local police. The Olinger was then extradited to Indiana and put in Crown Point Jail, which was notoriously escape-proof. But not for John. On March 3rd, 1934, Dillinger successfully escaped Crown Point, a feat now considered by many to be his most celebrated breakout. He did so using a razor and a piece of wood, which he used to carve a fake pistol. He called it a face gun with black shoe polish and used the prop to force past dozens of guards in his, to his freedom. It is reported that as on his way out, Dillinger was singing, I'm headed for the last roundup. And he drove the sheriff's car to Chicago, committing a federal offense by driving a stolen vehicle across state lines. This prompted the FBI to begin their search for the criminal. In the meantime, his gang was returned to Ohio, where they were convicted of the murder of the Lima sheriff they had left to die. In an attempt to escape, Markley was killed, and Pierpoint, Pierpont was left wounded. He recovered a month later, only to be executed right after. Following his escape from Crown Point, Dylan Drew joined his now girlfriend, Evelyn Frechette, in Chicago. The couple headed to St. Paul, and Dylan Drew joined the gangsters Homer Van Meter, Phoebe Felice Nelson, Eddie Green, and Tommy Carroll. The newly formed gang would work together in a successful bank robbing scheme. Though soon enough, Dylan Drew's career as a famous criminal would come to a dead stop. March 30th, 1934, FBA. FBI agents spoke to a manager at the Lincoln Court Apartments in St. Paul. The manager reported two suspicious tenants using the name Mr. and Mrs. Hellman. This led to the FBI beginning a surveillance of the Hellman's apartment. The following day, an agent and police officer knocked on the door. Evelyn opened the door and suspiciously, suspiciously quickly slammed it shut. The agents called in for reinforcements to surround the building. The agent saw a man enter a hall near the Hellman's unit and questioned him. It turned out to be Homer Van Meter, who quickly drew a gun. Shots were exchanged. Van Meter fled the building in the midst of the gunfire, got into a truck, and forced the driver at gunpoint to drive him to Eddie Green's apartment. Meanwhile, the Hellman's apartment door opened, and a machine gun quickly began spewing lead down the hallway. <clears throat> Inside the apartment, the Hellmans, a.k.a. Dillinger and Evelyn, fled through the back door and also drove to Green's apartment. There, Dillinger was treated for a bullet wound that he received in his escape. Back at the Lincoln Court Apartments, the FBI found Thompson's submachine gun, 
two automatic rifles, 138 caliber Colt automatic, and two bulletproof vests. At the same time, agents across town found Eddie Green's hideout. He and his girlfriend, a woman named Bessie Skinner, had been living there as Mr. and Mrs. Stevens. Green was located on April 3rd. He attempted to draw his gun when this happened, but he was shot by agents and died in a hospital eight days later. Dillinger and Evelyn made their way to Mooresville, Indiana, staying with Dillinger's father and half-brother while his wound continued to heal. Not long after, Evelyn went to Chicago to visit a friend where she was found and arrested by the FBI. She was put on trial on a charge of conspiracy to harbor a fugitive. She was convicted, fined $1,000, and sentenced to two years. Eddie Green's girlfriend, Bessie Skinner, received 15 months on the same charge. After yet another swift escape, Dillinger's gang was far from finished, wreaking havoc on the Midwest. The following month in April 1934, the FBI received a tip that there was a sudden influx of suspicious guests at the Little Bohemia Lodge, a summer resort in Wisconsin. The FBI concluded that one seemed to match the description of Dillinger, and one, Babyface Nelson. The FBI task force arrived on the scene, surrounded the lodge as dogs began to bark. Suddenly, a stream of bullets began beating down on them from machine guns on the roof. Meanwhile, Special Agent W. Carter Ball, another agent and a constable, went to a nearby location and found a parked car. Inside were three local residents being held at gunpoint by Baby Fence Nelson. Nelson turned and at gunpoint told the lawmen to get out of their vehicle. Though before they could, Nelson began to fire. Agent Ball was killed and the others were severely wounded. Nelson fled in their car. By the end of the night, Dillinger was gone. He had once again fled the scene of the crime, along with five other fugitives. In D.C., Special Agent Samuel Cowley was assigned to end the FBI's investigation against Dillinger. Cowley set up a headquarters in Chicago, and with the help of Special Agent Melvin Purvis, planned a strategy to finally catch the intangible Dillinger. Man and its legendary crime spree would come to an end on the night of July 22, 1934. A squad of agents under Agent Cowley worked with East Chicago police to track down all the possible tips and rumors leading to Dillinger's potential arrest. This led them to a woman named Anna Sage, who famously became known as the Woman in Red after her work with the FBI. Or Anna, butchering her name, Hannah Sage was a Romanian immigrant who had come to the U.S. in 1914 and worked in Chicago as a brothel in Madam. She was considered an undesirable alien due to the nature of her profession, and the Immigration and Naturalization Service had already begun her deportation proceedings. Recognizing a newspaper photo of Dillinger, Sage realized she knew him and his current girlfriend, a woman named Polly Hamilton. She agreed to reveal her information and help with the investigation for a cash reward. In addition to the FBI's help to prevent her deportation, on July 22nd, Sage informed the police that she would be attending a movie at a local theater with Dillinger and Polly Hamilton. While she would later be referred to as the woman in red, Sage actually wore an orange skirt in order to be more visible. The trio attended the viewing of Manhattan Melodrama and exited around 10.30 p.m. There, Dillinger found FBI agents waiting for him. True to his nature, he attempted to escape. This time, it was unsuccessful. Five shots were fired by the FBI in a nearby alley. And at 10.50 p.m. on July 22, 1934, John Dillinger was pronounced dead in a little room in the Alexian Brothers Hospital. He was the first man declared as America's public enemy number one and would forever be remembered as one of the most elusive criminals of all time. That is all we have for this episode of Shit Out of Luck on the True Crime Number 6 podcast. Let us know your thoughts on Dillinger in the comment section below. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. You can also listen to us on Good Pods out now on Android and iOS devices. You can find us on all major podcast platforms. And as always, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Pondex and Audible. Check them out today. Links will be in the description.
Thank you, and we'll see you next time.